All right. <clears throat> we are here. We are live. What's going on, everybody? Um, as folks start to trickle in, we will go ahead and um, I'll introduce myself again. Most of you probably know me. Um, a lot of you are existing customers. Some of you are new people who found us on Instagram or YouTube. Either way, we are super excited to have you here today. Um, <clears throat> and I'll introduce myself a little bit more in detail as more people continue to come in. But just as you're coming in, you can type in the chat box where you're viewing from. That would be awesome. Um, we always like to see the wide variety of places that people are, are viewing from. We have applicants all around the world. Um, most of them obviously are located in the United States, but there are people all over the world that um, are using our services to help them get into physical therapy school here in the United States. So please go ahead as you come in, go ahead and type where you're viewing from. I am in Arizona, <clears throat> uh, Florence, Arizona, which is a town about 45 minutes to an hour outside of Phoenix. Um, we love it in, Air in Florence. It's um, pretty slow. It's a smaller town, nice and quiet. It's great. We love, we love Arizona. Michael is viewing from Virginia. Michael, how you doing? Um, I've been to Virginia when I was in, um, I went to Charlottesville for a buddy's wedding. And then we went to Monticello <clears throat> or Monticello for uh, Thomas Jefferson's house, which was awesome. That's a pretty cool thing. Hey, Hannah is coming in from Virginia as well. How are you doing, Hannah? Um, and then West Covina, I'm sure that's California, I think. I'm not sure. Sorry, Eric, but I assume that's California. Hannah is in LA. Hannah Haid, um, welcome to everybody. We've got some, like I mentioned, we've got several people who are um, existing customers using our services, as well as many of you that are coming on now um, that I, I've, I recognize names from uh from instagram and things like that so excited to have you all here um Haley's from chicago and eric i was right okay good perfect um Haley, how are things in chicago good chicago is a place i have not been to i've been to la been to virginia um i haven't been to chicago before i'll have to swing by say hi not in the winter though because i don't know the midwest just looks awful so maybe in next summer or something <laughs> a different time but anyways, we got more and more people coming in. Uh, we got a good crew signed up for today. And I know you guys are really excited for um, why we're here, which is to talk about DPT program interviews. Okay, um, As you've seen on Instagram, those of you who follow us on Instagram, we have had a lot of individuals getting interview invites and acceptance offers, which is super fun. Um, but this is, it's a fun time of year. Like there's a lot of energy. There's kind of this culmination of, applicants are done with their essays, um, which many of you that I'm working with right now, that is not the case. Um, this week, especially if, I, if I'm coughing or I sound kind of under the weather, uh, I'm trying to fight off something because it's been not a lot of sleep this last week because we're trying to help people for through the uh, October 2nd um, submission deadline. But bear with me if I, if I sound a little under the weather. But I love this time of year because the holidays are here and we get to help applicants with interview coaching, which is really fun. Um, we'll talk more about that um, in particular, but let's go ahead and dive in. Um, some housekeeping items that I want to give you guys before we before we get rolling too far. So if the video freezes in for the masterclass, please don't panic. Just holler in the chat box. Your audio is off. The, the feed is off. A recording of the webinar is going to be sent out two hours after the presentation. So it's actually two hours after the presentation starts. So you'll get this um, a couple hours from now. And then you're going to get so much more out of the webinar today if you have stuff ready to write things down so you can apply what we talk about. Okay. Now, some more um, housekeeping we have. So the runtime for the webinar is going to be approximately an hour, um, maybe a little bit over that, just depending on how many questions you all have and how engaged you are. And then um, we have the presentation. I'm going to give you guys a coaching offer. And then you can ask me anything about interviews, other things like that. Okay. So that's our format for today. And let's go ahead and keep rolling. All right. So it is a Saturday afternoon. You have signed up for this webinar. What brings you here today? 
why would you choose on a Saturday afternoon to take some time out of your day to learn about application interviews? Why would you do that? You can go ahead and type in the chat box. Let me know. Do you have an interview coming up? If so, that's awesome. Congratulations. You are in the right place. If you are someone that is submitting your application soon and you're anxiously awaiting an interview invite, that's great too. Um, please don't freak out if you haven't received an interview invite yet. There's kind of this, this new wave of early uh, interview invitations that we've started to have to adapt to since application deadlines are earlier. But yeah, Michael got invited to an interview a few days ago. Congratulations, Michael. That's awesome. That is awesome. Super excited for you. Um, well-deserved. And getting an interview invite is, is such a validating pat on the back. Um, for so many applicants, right? It's because you feel like, okay, all the work I've done up until that point is valid, right? Um, Yamaya's got an interview next Friday. Hannah's getting ready to dominate her interview process. Um, Hannah Hayde is going to get ready for interview invites, right? Um, Emily has got an interview invite later this month. Awesome. So this is great. All these, all these are very applicable. And you guys can see that there's earlier and earlier interview um, times. Back in the day, we didn't really start interviewing until like end of October. But now we have September, October, November. It's almost like people don't want to do interviews around the Christmas holiday um, and New Year's. And a lot of times programs are trying to fill up their classes as soon as possible. So that way they can have time to extend invites to people who are on a wait list and things like that. So Super excited for those of you who have an interview. You are in the right place and you're going to learn a lot today. So, um, and if you don't and you're just here to learn, <clears throat> either way, dial in, take notes, buckle up because we got a lot to cover today. All right. So, my goals are to show you how anyone can become a skillful interviewee through practice and understanding of key and basic principles. Okay. I'll be sharing an exclusive limited time offer to receive personalized coaching to help you apply the principles that we're going to discuss today. So there's uh, in our information age, it is extremely easy to find out things about interviewing, but it is hard to apply the information and to become a successful interviewee, right? Because that takes work. It takes effort. It's something that everybody can do, but the difference between people who succeed in interviews and those who don't are the people who know how to prepare and to have their unique selling pitch ready to go, okay? So um, we're going to dive into that. Let's go ahead. And those of you who are old customers, I'm sorry. You're probably sick of seeing these slides, but I'll go through it for those of you who don't know about, uh, don't know about me or you're new to physical therapy application coach. Um, so first and foremost, I'm going to go backwards order this time. I'm going to start with my family. Um, so the picture on my right is a, uh, well, not my right, my left on the video screen, sorry, um, is <clears throat> of my beautiful family. So that's, uh, my wife, my two daughters, and then our youngest daughter, who's just three months old. We don't have a good updated family picture of all of us. So I'm waiting until, uh, I think we're doing that in November. I can't remember. My wife's got it scheduled, but we're doing another family picture in November but this is uh, my crew. This is who keeps me busy besides, besides pre-PT Nation. Uh, it's Brewer Nation over here, my family. And love, these, love all of these girls. They're awesome. Um, super fun and enjoy being the, my you know, husband to my wife and the dad to my kids. Um, and I've been coaching for 10 years, helping pre-PTs get into uh, PT school, which makes me feel kind of old to say that. But um, I've been in some form of mentoring, coaching, counseling, um, started when I was in the pre-PT club and continued to build this, uh, this platform to help applicants get into PT school over the past decade, which is just crazy to think. I was selected by NAU faculty to review application essays and perform interviews for 17 incoming applicants. So I was on a panel of people who, uh, it was myself, a faculty, and an alumni um, this was when I was in my second year of PT school. So some of you may have a similar experience to be able to do this as well. And it's awesome to be able to see the future applicants that are coming into a program and to be a part of like determining who you think should get in, um, who belongs in your program, because you want the best people to be there and to represent your program well. So um, I'll, I'll share more about that experience, but I learned a lot. Um, I had a lot of my thoughts validated about what needed to be done to help applicants be successful. 
Um, but in addition to that, I also learned some things not to do, some things to avoid. Um, and that was just very valuable experience. So um, completed going on 1,500 application essays. Uh, we've had a bunch since our, our last essays webinar that we had. And um, just over 400 mock interviews performed as we've started to have more mock interview coaching. So been really fun. And we're increasing the number of programs that um, applicants have been accepted to. We're now up to 173 DPT programs from all across the country. And I personally was accepted to five of the six highly competitive programs I applied to. I ultimately chose to go to NAU for my doctor of physical therapy degree. Um, <clears throat> I went from, to my undergrad at Brigham Young University in Provo. We won our first Big 12 football game at home yesterday. So that's good. Go Cougs. And uh, I currently work for ATI Physical Therapy as an outpatient physical therapist. Um, and I've enjoyed my experience there. It's That's my nice, stable, boring job <laughs> that I have. And then I have all these other exciting things that I do with physical therapy application coach. So um, I do treat full time. I have a full time job and I'm trying to I'm basically doing TAPCO depending on the time of the year full time as well. So it's so that it's, this is basically my life right here is uh, work, my family and you guys. So um, thank you so much for letting me introduce myself and let's dive in again. All right. So everything that you have worked so hard for for the past two to six or more years all comes down to this moment of your interview, okay? You have been, um, Hannah, thank you. Hannah's all about the shout outs. She's awesome. She's a brand champion. We've been working with, <laughs> with Hannah on a lot of essays. Um, she's doing awesome. Hope you're feeling better. So um, <clears throat> you get to this stage of the inter of getting an interview invite and it is time to empty the tank and prepare like your entire application rests on this interview because in all actuality, it really does. Okay. So as far as that's concerned, when you get invited to an interview, basically all other factors go out the window. You and the other people that get invited to attend an interview, you can essentially look at each other like you're complete equals and you're starting with a blank slate. Because by being invited to a program interview, that is how a program tells you that they believe that you are worth uh, being reviewed more closely to see if they want you to come into their program. And at this point, it's not so much about your competence as an academically. It's more about if you're the right fit for that program. If you're the type of person that's going to be able to conduct themselves like a professional at all times, when you're in the program and when you leave the program, right? Um, and as far as we go with that, I've had applicants who are very conceited. They have really, really high applications, really strong applications, 4.0, perfect GRE scores, 10,000 observation hours. They've done academic research for three years. Like they look perfect on paper. And we work with them on their essays. <clears throat> and I ask them about, well, are you, in, are you curious about interview coaching? Would you like to get some help with prepping for your interviews? And they're like, no, my application's great. It's just a formality. I, I don't need to worry about it, right? Then we follow up with them a few months down the road and we find out that they are either on a wait list or they didn't get accepted into a program. And when that happens, when you are such a strong applicant and you don't get accepted or you are on a wait list, chances are your interview was what hosed you. And if you would have been prepared and you have an applicant, an application that's that strong and you would have knocked your interview out of the park, you can pick your poison. You can pick out of all the DPT programs you get accepted to, and you can have options, okay? <clears throat> we have applicants right now that have a wide variety of options. Um, there was a, a, an email that I posted. One applicant already has two acceptance offers and has 12 interview invites. Um, this individual did not work with us on program selection. So love him. He's doing awesome, but he applied to so many schools and he probably didn't need to, <laughs> need to apply to that many. But either way, the principle of the matter is you want to make sure you have options for where you go to physical therapy school. You don't want to just go somewhere because it's the only place that invited you, right? Um, you should apply, every program you apply to should be a place that you'd be happy to go to. But at the end of the day, it's always better to have options than to just be stuck with one route, okay? In addition to that, we've had applicants who have a 3.0. Maybe they had, uh, they don't have as many observation hours. Maybe they've had family or life experiences that have, force their application to not be as strong up until this point because they just had to survive, right? That's happened frequently. 
um, especially during COVID. We had a lot of applicants that really had a tough time and they had to, we had to figure out how to sell them during their interview. But either way, those applicants who were 3.0, we went in, we said, okay, you really have to prepare like this is everything that you can prepare like this is the only thing in your application that matters. Uh, because the fact that you get an interview invite is awesome and you have to maximize that opportunity and give it everything you've got. So please empty the tank during this time when it's time to prepare for interviews and let's get after it. Okay. Uh, this is, you can pat yourself on the back for two seconds after you get an interview invite and then it's focus. Okay. Until you have six acceptance offers, then you can relax. Okay. But now we've got to treat it like our life depends on it. Um, and you'll thank me later for this. I'm not saying you need to be stressed out all the time, but just prepare. Don't become complacent when you, because you have an interview invite. You are going to be up against the cream of the crop for limited seats. And DPT programs now have the opportunity to interview more applicants than they ever have before because of virtual interviews. Um, and they there's oftentimes larger group interviews where they interview four, five, six applicants at in one 30 to 45 minute period. And so more and more applicants are getting in front of more and more programs and programs can be more picky about who they pick. All right. So that is what is on the line when it comes down to this interview. Okay. All right. So this is something that uh, it's been something that's been on my mind for a long time when it comes to interview invites, uh, especially is <clears throat> you have to prepare for the event that you are going to be competing in. Okay. There's a quote right here. It's from Ar Archeoclus. I can't remember exactly how to pronounce it, but he is a famous Greek lyric poet and soldier. Um, and he says, we don't rise to the level he said, he is not alive anymore. <laughs> we don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. I love that quote because so many times in business, in different areas, people say, well, those that I'm working with are going to rise to the level of expectations I set for them. They may, but if they're not trained on how to rise to that level of expectation, then they won't rise to it. And um, that includes yourself. So I don't know of an applicant who gets an interview invite who says, oh, I'm going to do bad in this interview. Everyone, usually, most of the time, they're overconfident. They think, oh, I got an interview invite. I'm going to go and I'm going to knock it out of the park. It's going to be a piece of cake, right? That's what most applicants are going to say. Other applicants are going to be very afraid and they're like, oh, I'm going to be against all these other applicants and they're so much better than me. We'll talk more about this, but that's the under and the overconfidence effect, okay? And how both of those can be very damaging to you. Then uh, the next point here is you're not going to show up to the compete in the Olympics without practicing the event that you're competing in, whether it's the high jump, maybe you're doing the 200 meter butterfly, whatever, right? Whatever the event is that you're competing in, you will have done that event over and over and over and over again and practiced it multiple times. You should be doing something similar to prepare for your interviews, okay? If you really want to get serious about getting accepted into PT school, as you should because you've applied, so you should not be applying with the intent to reapply. You should always be applying with the intent to get in your first time. Um, you need to take your interview preparations very seriously, okay? With that being said, I'm going to just touch on this briefly because this is a this is such a simple point that I just, I don't know. Asking People asking what they need to wear to interviews over and over again. At this point, whether it's virtual or in person, ladies on the left, gentlemen on the right, okay? This is what you should be wearing. You need to be wearing business professional attire to this um, interview. Again, whether it's at home, on Zoom, in your bedroom, or whether you are going in person, you need to dress to impress. Get a haircut. Uh, make sure your beard's shaved if you're a gentleman, right? Like, either way, look your best. Look professional. And then I'll say this for, for the young ladies, right? This one is particularly heartbreaking, okay? When I was at NAU and I was reviewing or we were interviewing applicants who came in, we had several young ladies who came in who were not wearing modest attire 
to the interview. And this wasn't me that made the comment. I was with a female alumni and a female faculty member. Okay. As soon as they, that group walked out, they both made a comment about how they were concerned with how those immodest, those who dressed immodestly presented themselves and they got marked down. Okay. I was thinking the same thing, but I didn't say a word, right? I wanted to just see what other people would say. It is distracting. Okay. It is distracting to the other applicants in the room. It is distracting to the people interviewing you. The focus should be on you and why you're awesome, not on what you're wearing and what you're wearing should not look like you're going out on the town. If that makes sense. Okay. So there are applicants who have done this. I've heard of it before uh, other people talking about, I asked them about how their interviews went and I've had other applicants share. There were some other people who weren't dressed appropriately for the activity. I'm not saying you need to wear only gray or black tones. You can dress professionally and look nice, but just be professional, be modest, please. Don't shoot yourself in the foot before you start interviewing. Okay. Should be pretty straightforward. Gentlemen, wear suit and tie. Ladies, wear modest business professional. Okay. All right. So this is the beautiful Phoenix biomedical campus that um, NAU's Phoenix campus that they have. They're actually adding a hybrid program um, online now as well. So they've got all kinds of different uh, opportunities that are coming up. So um, like I mentioned, I've, I've uh, alluded to this a couple times, 17 applicants <clears throat> were interviewed by myself, a faculty advisor, and an alumni from NAU. And we would ask them standard set of questions. So for a one of the most competitive DPT programs, especially out on the West Coast, NAU, I've been able to look at all of those questions. Just saying. And eh, I don't know, probably 95% of that list is on our list of the best questions to ask, right? This was several years ago, but the questions don't really change too much, right? Um, the, the focus of an interview has shifted a little bit. Uh, to ask more about situational, scenario-based questions, ethical questions, things like that. And we'll, we'll get into those a little bit more. But either way, from this experience, I basically told you the things that I learned. Um, I learned about the importance of making sure you represent yourself well with how you dress. And then, I'll never forget this, you could tell immediately who was prepared for the interview and who was not. Okay, We asked an applicant, uh, I think he was the first person that we actually asked because in a, in a group setting, when you have four five, six individuals in a room and you're asking, you're doing like a round robin where it's basically, okay, applicant number one, we're going to ask you a question. You're going to answer first and then we'll go down the line and then we'll have applicant number two answer first next time. And then you just rotate. Okay. So ask applicant number one, well, we'd like to just have you take a few minutes to tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. So, this applicant said, well, I like to play the guitar and I like to garden. And that was it. That was it. And I, it took just about all of me to not face palm for him because I was just like, oh my gosh, what a missed opportunity. This is my first impression. The first words that come out of your mouth are you like to play guitar and garden and you are in a DPT program interview at one of the most competitive DPT programs on the West Coast. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? I felt so bad for this young man because you could tell he was so nervous and he didn't have a clue. He didn't have a clue because he wasn't prepared. But then we converse that with individuals that we work with. Boom. They know immediately what to say. They know their talking points. They know their unique selling points and they go out and they deliver and they dominate their interviews. You're not dominating over other people. You are dominating your own unique story, your own unique selling point. And because you dominate with being able to sell yourself as an applicant, you don't need to say anything negative against other applicants. You just know how to sell yourself in the most effective way and to show that you are someone who's going to be a builder, who's going to come into the, this community of this program and be an asset to them and not a liability. Okay. So the difference between those two was very, very stark. There was people who came in and they were prepared and there were those who had no clue what they were doing. The difference, one of the other key differences that we saw was the individuals who were prepared, when they would ask, when we would ask them a question, they would pause momentarily and they would gather themselves and they would look you square in the eye and they would give you a succinct, concise answer that was 30 seconds. Other applicants who had no clue what to talk about and had no idea what they were saying would 
say, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Well, what I would like to tell you is a story about one time that I did. And they just, two and a half minutes later, I have no idea what they said. They said a bunch of words, but it didn't mean anything, right? There is a clear difference. And you can confidently and articulately go into this interview and be ready to go. If you are prepared and you know what to do. All right. So anyways, I told most of this. Oh, here's some other things. Thinking you're a strong interviewee versus being a strong interviewee. Okay. There were some applicants that came in and you can just tell there's kind of like this presence that they have that they, they think they're hot stuff. And they, there are other applicants that come in. They're cool. They're calm. They're confident and they're collected. And there's just a different presence, right? There's a difference between thinking that you're a strong interviewee versus being a strong interviewee. And the best way to do it is to do mock interviews and to have someone who is 100% on your side brutally and honestly tell you, you did not do good on this, or these are things that you need to work on, or these are things that you did awesome. Do more of this. Okay. Um, there's a big difference. The other thing that was different was a lot of these applicants who were really successful, they focused on using stories to show us why they were awesome instead of just telling us about why they were awesome, okay? Those of you who've been a part of our essays webinars know that this is going to sound very familiar, okay? Focus on showing, not telling, okay? And this came through time and time again. The purpose of any DPT program interview is to make a good impression and to have people remember you, okay? And to the opposite effect, if you're not dressed professionally, if you don't know your talking points, if you're stumbling over yourself, if you don't have good thoughtful questions to ask a program when you show up to that interview, that's a bad impression. I'm sorry, but that's a bad impression. And you don't want to live leave that kind of impression. You want them to just be so excited to extend you an interview offer or an acceptance offer to say, we need Hannah. We need both of the Hannahs at our program. We need Michael. We need Yamaya. We need Eric in our program. We need these applicants, right? We need you to come to our program. And so they're just chomping at the bit to send you an acceptance offer. That's the kind of impression that we want. We want someone who remembers you, who remembers how professional and how awesome you are and how much they want you to be a part of their DPT program, okay? And then I talked about the last one, ready to ramble versus ready to rumble. Please practice, pause, know your talking points, and you're going to be ready to rumble instead of ready to ramble. Okay? I'm going to take a drink. Is this making sense? Are you guys getting like, I hope you're getting excited because there's a lot of stuff that's coming. But go ahead and type in the chat box if you're if you're picking up what I'm putting down. If you're if you're like, you know what? Yes, I want to be this kind of applicant. I want to know what to do. Please tell me. All right, go ahead and type in the chat. While you guys are, are putting those uh, those comments in, I'm also Hannah is hyped. Yes, Michael is hyped. Let's go. Okay. Um, let's talk about why interviews are often stumbling blocks. Okay. Macy's hyped. Eric's hyped. Let's go. Come on, gang. Um, so interviews are often Haley's hyped. Everybody's getting in on the hype train here. So interviews are often stumbling blocks for applicants because of the overconfidence effect and the underconfidence effect. I mentioned this before. Okay. So you might feel like you're a pawn. You might feel like you're a king or a queen. And either way, you may be right. You may be wrong. But interviews for people who think they are better than they actually are can be a disaster for your application. And interviews for someone who thinks, and maybe objectively on paper, they're not the greatest applicant, right? Maybe they're not. But if they go into the interview embracing that idea, it's going to be a stumbling block for them. That interview is not going to go well. When you step into an interview environment, you need to come in with an intensity and a ferocity that says, I deserve to be here in this program. I deserve a seat in this program. I know that. I was. If you get an interview invite, I don't want you to have any question that you deserve a seat. And the only way to go get a seat is to claim it, to go in and to know your talking points and to share these passionately with 
the people that are interviewing with you. And you're going to be able to speak more passionately and from the heart because you know your talking points. I'm going to go off on a tangent for a second. How do you think I can be so hyped about application interviews? I've given so many of these webinars. I've spent time over over and over and over again, reviewing these talking points, teaching these talking points to applicants for over 10 years. It's a part of who I am, right? I know it works. I know it works. I've seen it time and time again. I've witnessed applicants come in and they feel like a pawn and they leave feeling like a king or a queen because they have finally embraced that they're awesome, that they deserve a seat in a DPT program, that they are on the path to fulfilling their dreams and becoming a doctor in physical therapy. Okay. So this, this mirror goes both ways. Applicants who feel like they're hot stuff, they will under prepare and they will often flop during an interview. Applicants who feel like they're not such hot stuff will be so self-conscious and so fearful that they don't belong in the program, that that is what's the, the presence and the lack of confidence that they bring is going to be the impression that is left on those who are reviewing them. And that's not what you want, okay? I remember we had applicants, they had lower GPAs. They came in and they knocked our socks off. And I was like, I don't care what their GPA is. I want that person because that person knows who they are. They have clarity of thought. There's someone who's articulate. There's someone who knows what they stand for and what they bring to this program. That's what I want. I don't care if you have a 4.0. If you're a, a mouse, and you have a 4.0 and you're going to sit in the corner and not contribute, that's not going to help anybody, right? And I'm not saying you need to be, you know, you don't need to be like me and be all loud mouth and, and talk like crazy and just run your mouth. There's a difference though. You can be someone who is an introvert, which believe it or not, I'm actually an introvert, right? It, being around people exhausts me, <laughs> but um, I get, I enjoy being around other people. It's fun, but it, it drains me. So where was I going with that? You can still be an introvert and know your talking points and be articulate and deliver concise, powerful answers. And you can also be an extrovert and rein in some of your exuberance a little bit and be more professional and be more dialed in, more focused and concise. Okay. Either way, either personality type, you're going to benefit from knowing your talking points. Okay. All right. So how do we overcome the over and the underconfidence effects? Practice. Practice, 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 okay? And to know what you're preparing for. What's the environment that you're going into? If you know what the arena looks like, you're going to be able to strategize on how you're going to win this battle, okay? All right, so I want you to talk to you about preparing your answers versus memorizing, okay? So applicants who focus on memorizing are going to hyper-focus on having their answers perfectly rehearsed for a small number of questions, they will freeze or they will ramble if they're asked questions that they haven't memorized. And they're generally more fearful or anxious and constantly compare themselves to others. Okay. They're also terrified that if they are asked a question they didn't prepare for, that they will fail and they won't get accepted. Okay. These are applicants who hyper-focus on memorizing answers. Please do not be this kind of applicant. There is a big difference. So let's talk about what that is. Preparing versus memorizing. If you are prepared, you are going to have a strong grasp of the key points that you want to convey to an admissions committee, okay? These are like mental flashcards, bullet points that you have ready to go. And you are confident in who you are as an applicant and why you deserve a seat at that program, okay? You have an inventory of experiences or stories that you can share and show versus tell. You've also built up a reservoir of content that can be used to respond to questions that you may not have prepared for, but those answers are appropriate for those question types. And you, these applicants accept the fact that there is no way that you can have an answer ready to every single potential question they may ask you, okay? Even our top 50 recommended uh, mock interview questions, there may be questions that they ask you that are completely different. And that's fine because our philosophy is we're gonna turn you into a ninja who can, no matter what the question is, you can slice and dice it up because you have con the content that you need in your head. You have your talking points in your head and you can go and deliver those, okay? Um, that's the difference between being prepared versus memorizing. Please don't memorize. Don't type out a block of text and then stress out 
if you stumble over a sentence in the middle and say, oh, I'm never going to get in. Don't do that to yourself, okay? It's all right to be human and to make mistakes, to stumble over your words. I used to freak out when I first started doing um, – when I first started doing webinars, that if I didn't go through my script exactly right, that people weren't going to listen to me. And then I said, forget this. I know what I want to talk about. I'm excited about this issue. I love pre-PTs. I love working with them and helping them progress in their goals. I am going to make sure I know what I want to talk about, and then I'm going to go for it because it's a part of me and it's a part of who I am, and I know my unique selling pitch, right? That's what I want for you, to be prepared but don't freak out about memorizing, okay? All right, so let's talk about the most common interview format. So we want to get the arena ready. What's the type of environment that we're going into, okay? So we have one-on-one -on -one interviews. These are less common, but they still happen just because DPT programs now want to have as many applicants in front of them as possible. So the most popular type of interview right now is a group round-robin interview where it's potentially a panel of people interviewing, so of interviewers, and four, five, six, seven individuals in a Zoom room or in a, uh, in a classroom that are being interviewed, right? Um, and this is, this is the most popular way because it gives inter the, the programs the most bang for their buck. One-on-one um, -on -one interviews just aren't as common, but they still do happen depending on how the, the program structures them. Panel interviews are when you are interviewed by a panel of individuals, right? So there's there's several different people, kind of like my scenario at NAU. You've got uh, a student, a faculty member, an alumni. They're all asking you questions, okay? Um, collaborative interviews, collaborative group interviews, these are the type of interviews where you'll be brought in. You may be given a scenario or some type of problem that you have to solve, and you're paired up with three, four, five, six other individuals, and they ask you, to how you would solve this problem, okay? So that is, those are the, the two different types of group interviews, round robin and collaborative. Collaborative is not as common just because it's more difficult to assess applicants accurately. Round robin interviews gives everybody a fair chance to answer questions, okay? Multiple MMIs, multiple mini interviews is basically, it's kind of like speed dating, but for interviews. You sit down, you... Uh, someone, the interviewer asks you a question, you answer the question, and then you move to a different area in the room and you're asked a different question. Okay. So uh, these are kind of difficult just because you don't have the consistency. You can't really build a rapport or a relationship with someone. Um, you can, and you should build a rapport with them in the short period of time that you're there, but it's not the same as having like a 10, 15 minute conversation with someone in a one-on-one -on -one interview. Right. It really, it's just, just different. Now, how are you going to find out what kind of format your interview is? Okay. The number one way and the way that we recommend is sometimes they'll include it in the interview invite. They'll say, you are going to be, this is what the interview schedule looks like. This is potentially who you're interviewing with. They may or may not give you a lot of information. But our experience has been, if you ask for more information about the interview, they will give it to you. They may not give you the everything. But you're going to get more information if you respond to the interview and say, oh, my gosh, I'm so excited to come to this interview. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you can give me the consideration. I was just curious if you could give me any more information about how the interview is going to be conducted in this format. If it's a Zoom meeting, am I going to be with other uh, am I going to be with other applicants or is it just going to be me and one other individual? Um, if it's in person, what are we going to do? Right. So these are the things that we look at. Um, Make sure that you ask and follow up. And what's the worst thing they can say? Oh, I, I'm not at liberty to disclose any more details about the, the interview. I, I don't think they'll do that. I think they're always going to give you more than give you something rather than nothing, right? Um, what would be an example of a problem from a collaborative interview? Okay, so Michael, that's a great, a great question. So most of the time, it's probably going to be something related to like, there's this issue in the community right? Um, whether it's maybe it's food insecurity or homelessness, or uh, maybe it's going to be a healthcare related issue, or it'll be a case study. There's a variety of different things. Um, it's, it's usually going to be something relevant. Other times, it might be something completely outside the scope of healthcare. Um, it could be like, okay, we're on a deserted island. What are we going to do? How are we going to get it off? Right? 
And the whole purpose of a collaborative interview is to just see how people interact with other individuals. Um, so in those settings, you don't want to be a steamroller. You don't want to come in and be this like alpha male, alpha female that's coming in and like, you're going to listen to me and you're going to do things my way. That's not how you want to come across. It's important to share your ideas and to share your points of view, but you want to be someone who's including everybody, right? Be a facilitator, be someone who's sharing your ideas, but also including other people. And that's going to show DPT programs. Hey, this applicant, they're awesome. They love to share and they want to contribute and listen to other people's ideas. And that's the, those are the kind of people they want in their program because they don't want people who just all think I'm the best. I deserve to be here. Nobody else does. Right. Like that's, that's not going to help you get into PT school if you have that attitude. But if you come in and you say, Hey, uh, Sarah, you've shared quite a few ideas, but we haven't heard anything from Tony. Should we, should we let Tony have some, you know, Tony, do you have any insights about what we could do? Right. Or whatever. Be a facilitator. Don't be someone who's just there trying to elbow your way to the front of the line. Try to bring everybody along with you so the group can be united and can show that you are someone who can bring about unity in a group. Okay? All right. So now we've got question types. Okay? So we have brand, situational or scenario-based questions, and big picture questions. These are the, the main three categories that we recommend that applicants prepare for during interview season, okay? So brand questions are things about who you are as an individual, who you are as an applicant, and what your unique selling points are, okay? These are things like, we'll, we'll go through different questions, but essentially your brand questions, you should have these down pat, or you should have the ideas for these down pat by going through some mock interviews, Okay. Having these is like, this is basically your unique selling point. Situational or scenario based questions, you're going to use stories from your life and personal experiences to demonstrate principles about why you're awesome and why they should pick you for a program. Okay. Or use stories that allow you to answer their questions. Big picture questions. These are like, where do you see healthcare evolving? Different things like that. They want to see your thought process and see that you've taken the time to look into the profession and what the future looks like and where things are going and what you want to do to try to be a positive impact in the, in the future, in this profession. Okay. And we're going to go through each of these and give you some strategies, situational or scenario based questions. I, I uh, didn't really mention this too much. Basically you should have several different questions. Um, if you use the ones that we give you today and then you pick three to five stories that you could use to answer that question, you're going to be good to go. Okay. And a lot of these stories can have some overlap between different questions, but you shouldn't have the same three stories for all of the questions, like have some diversity, bring in some different things into your application. Don't just talk about one area of your application. Um, if you're a student athlete, don't just talk about being a student athlete, talk about your shadowing experiences, talk about your life experiences Talk about humanitarian service, community to service, different things like that um, from situational scenario based. Okay. All right. So let's look at brand questions. Okay. Tell me about yourself. Why do you want to become a PT? What are your greatest strengths and weaknesses? And how are you prepared to meet the needs of diverse and underserved populations? Tell me about yourself is your minute and a half to two and a half minute elevator pitch. All right. This is going to look at your academics, your extracurricular activities, your some information about, you know, some brief information about who you are and the things you enjoy doing outside of school and pre-PT stuff. Um, if you did academic research, you should absolutely talk about it in this section. You should talk about your observation hours. You should talk about leadership experiences that you've had, community service. And it can be hard to think, how can I say all that in two minutes, right? But it can be done. And it can be done because you're being articulate and you know your talking points and you can zip through them. It's not a memorized script. It's knowing your talking points and moving smoothly from one to the next, okay? A lot of applicants, they do all right with writing down what they uh, would share, but they struggle with putting it all together. And that's the tricky part, right? So um, that is where things get challenging. And so that's what we do with our applicants that we coach is we say, okay, let's get everything out on paper. And then we give you a sample of what that would look like to make it smooth. And then we roll from there. 
Brand questions are usually what we spend the majority of our first call on because they're the most important. And then we give you some homework to work on situational or scenario-based questions um, from our list of top 50 recommended um, questions. And then uh, we go from there. Okay. So let's tell me about yourself. Why do you want to become a physical therapist? Okay. This is the dreaded question because a lot of applicants are going to fall into the trap of saying the exact same thing that other applicants do, which is, I'm just waiting for people to see if they can say, I want to help people. And I love the human body. It just, don't say that, please, for the love of Pete, do not say that, okay? Go deeper. Ask yourself, why is it that I want, how does physical therapy allow me to help people in a way that I can't with any other job? How does physical therapy allow me to use an understanding of human anatomy in a way I can't with any other job? How? How does, how does that happen, right? So those are things that you need to look for. And to ask yourself is keep going deeper. If you're like, well, I want to help people. Why do you want to help people? How do you want to help people? How does physical therapy allow you to help people in a way that you can't with any other job? Why, uh, why do you want to work with the human body? How does physical therapy allow you to use an understanding of the human body to benefit and serve people? Ask yourself those questions and then you'll get to your more of your root cause and just keep asking and asking and asking until you get a deep, really solid answer that's personal to you. Okay. Greatest strengths and weaknesses. Okay. Greatest strengths. We typically recommend you pick three and you talk a little bit about how you develop those and what they are and why they're meaningful. Greatest weaknesses. This is a booby trap. Okay. You are going to talk about one weakness, talk about what that weakness is and spend the majority of your answer talking about what you're doing to work on it. So this still shows that you've got good self-awareness but it's more optimistic and hopeful focusing on what you're doing to improve, right? You don't need to share. Don't pull all of your skeletons out of the closet. When we've been practicing with applicants and we ask them that question, we see if they fall for the booby trap the first time. And sometimes it's terrifying. And I'm like, you just met these people and you're going to tell them all of these things that maybe your significant other doesn't even know. What are you doing? (laughs) Just don't do that. Right? So focus on one weakness Talk about what you're doing to overcome that weakness. That should be the majority of your answer, okay? And then how are you prepared to meet the needs of diverse and underserved populations? This is kind of a situational question, but either way, this is looking at 30,000 foot view. How are you ready to work with people who are different from you, right? The United States continues to become a place where there's more, um, more diversity. There's more opportunities for different people. More people have access to healthcare. And as a result of that, we are going to be working with people who are different from us. How can we do that professionally and still maintain our professional duty to leave people better than we find them and to serve them for their musculoskeletal needs? Um, But how do we do that in a way that accepts that people are different, they have different life experiences, different worldviews? How can you show me experiences that you have from your own life where you've worked with people who are different than you? So go through and I itemize those lists. Look through different examples of those, okay? All right, so those are brand questions. Now we're gonna go into situational or scenario-based questions. First one, tell me a time that you are resilient. Describe to me a time you faced an ethical dilemma. What was that dilemma and how did you respond? Tell me about a conflict you faced with another person and how you dealt with it. Tell me about a time that you received constructive criticism and how you responded. Okay, pretty straightforward. You probably hear these questions and your wheels start turning. You're like, oh, I can maybe talk about this. Maybe I can talk about this patient that I worked with. Maybe uh, I can talk about this experience where I really had a difficult timeline with school. Or maybe um, it was during a period of time when you had like lost a loved one and you still had to try to keep your life afloat. Like there's all kinds of different things that you could talk about. And this is where you separate and differentiate yourself between your brand questions and your situational or scenario based questions, embrace your own life experience. It's the only thing that is uniquely yours and being able to share these things in an engaging and compelling way is important. Something else that I'll share is the importance of telling a story effectively. Okay. So there's four components to every good story. Those of you who have been on my essay coaching and you've worked with me, especially for supplementals, we harp on this a lot. Okay, you need to set the scene, introduce the conflict, 
Tell me what you did to make a positive impact and share with me why that was a meaningful experience. That's a good story. You check all the boxes on those. A lot of applicants set the scene and tell me what the conflict is, but they do not come in for points three and four. They don't, they don't tell us what the resolution was, which is like a big nothing burger. At that point, you just had, you know, a brain lapse and you're thinking, why did you tell me this story? You just told me the problem, but you didn't tell me what you did to make, to fix it. Right. And that is not what you want to do. So with these situational or scenario based questions, focus on those four key ideas, set the scene, tell me what the conflict or the tension point is. What did you do to overcome that conflict or tension? And why was that experience meaningful for you? Okay. How is it going to prepare you to be a great PT in the future? All right. So that's situational or scenario based questions. Big picture questions. All right. So this is, these are mostly just, you go through them, you do some research, you get on the APTA website, you look at current events, you can look at um, influencers on social media who are talking about uh, current events in healthcare and physical therapy. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this. I would recommend starting with the APTA because those are going to be things that are top of mind. Um, you could look at research articles, you could look at publications, different things like that. Um, you could look at the APTA's uh, social media pages as well, because they will talk about a lot of issues that they're working on. Um, I don't love the APTA in general. Not a fan. Uh, they've, they've failed us more often than they've helped us. But they're still, rel- they're still trying to keep their eyes on the things that matter, right? Uh, so the main thing APTA has done is increase student loan debt more than anything. They've increased the cost of tuition, and there's been no subsequent increase in pay. So good job. Nice job, APTA. That's my main beef with them. Anyways, so um, big picture questions. Look at where the, the profession of physical therapy is headed. Where do you think it's going? Gather some thought process, gather some data points. We have a post coming up this next week that we're going to share. I'm going to share where I think physical therapy is headed. Um, it's got good news and bad news, just like every, any profession, right? There's going to be some good things, some opportunities, and there's going to be some changes that are coming down the pipe. And how are we going to respond and how are we going to adapt to that? How do you see healthcare evolving? What is your personal interpretation of the American Physical Therapy Association's vision and mission statement? Go look it up. State it in your own words. You should just know that, right? Like this is our professional organization. Whether you like them or not, whether you're like me and you're bitter, right? This is our professional organization and this is what they're trying to do. Um, What attributes does a great physical therapist have? Do you possess these qualities? Okay. Uh, These are other great things that you can look at. And, and write down. So those are big picture questions. Just looking at healthcare, the landscape of healthcare in general, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Um, different things. Okay. So those are the, the main areas. If you are pressed for time, I would focus on situational and scenario based questions and brand questions. Okay. If these are the only ones that you look at. You're going to be more prepared than probably 80 to 90% of applicants. Okay. All right. So guys, we're coming to the section where we're going to talk to you about our coaching offer that we have today, okay? I want you to prepare for the event that you're going to be about to compete in. For many of you, right? Many of you listed at the beginning that you're getting ready to um, have an interview. A bunch of people, uh, a bunch of people who messaged me over the week and they said, hey, I can't come to the live event, but I have an interview coming up. Is there going to be a recording sent out? This is for you too right? You must prepare for this event that's coming because it may be the only interview that you get, right? Hopefully not, but it may be the only one that you get and you need to treat it like it's your last and it's the only one that you have, okay? You aren't going to show up to the Olympics without training. You need to train with the best. You can train with the best or you can train with someone else, okay? You can come, you can learn from us, you can learn from people who have been doing this for over a decade, who have been in the room as applicants have been evaluated and know what people are looking for and have helped hundreds, thousands of applicants get accepted into PT school, okay? And that's through all of our platforms. If you really want to get accepted into PT school, you need to take your application and interview preparation seriously and consider working with us like all of these applicants did, okay? Okay. So these are applicants from all over the country, coast to coast, north, south, that have been able to successfully gain acceptance into a DPT program. This is just from the past couple of years, okay? And each of these applicants had their own story. They had awesome things that they did. 
And it was so impactful to be able to work with these people who come from a wide variety of backgrounds and to be able to share with them what's awesome, what's unique, what's special that they have to bring to the table. Okay. So this is your opportunity to learn about how you can join with us. So let's talk about this coaching package. So you have two one hour, one on one coaching sessions. Okay. You get mock interview coaching. Usually the first session, it's mostly we're helping you get your brand questions set up. We're going to prepare you to start doing some homework for some situational and some big picture questions. Okay. Then you have one hour of video course content as well as self evaluation worksheets to help you answer the mock interview questions that we have so you can have some ideas on paper. We have our top 50 recommended interview practice questions list. This thing is gold because it's going to give you the things to work on and then resources to help you transition successfully from a pre PT to an SPT to a DPT. Okay. So practicing your questions out loud, I cannot overstate this, right? You are not going to, a lot of applicants will prepare mentally. They'll read questions and they'll like, oh, I could say this and I could say this, but they have not made the neural connections of hearing a question and verbalizing it. And that is so important that you practice these questions out loud, okay? If you want to go work with a subpar interviewing coach or you want to just ask a roommate or you want to go ask your mom or your dad who maybe they've done some interviews before, I don't know, maybe your parents are headhunters and they've done thousands of interviews and they're better than me. But either way, in this niche market of pre-PT interviewing, you want to have someone who's been there and who knows what's going to help you to be most successful in this environment, okay? So, um, and then also give you the practice, the verbal repetitions of getting feedback from someone saying, yes, say this, don't say this. Focus on this, don't focus on this, right? Um, so that's what we get with these two hours of coaching. Let's talk about the value, okay? No more reapplication expenses. So if you apply to 10 programs, it's almost $700. You get to save that money because you're able to get accepted the first time you apply. Or if you're a reapplicant, you get accepted the first time that you're applying with us. At least $3,000 in savings from not purchasing unnecessary textbooks. You get one year closer to that sixty dollars to $90,000 starting DPT salary. You get to learn about mastering your finances, paying off debt, different things like that. Maximize opportunities for employment, networking, entrepreneurial pursuits. Move forward with life, whether that's marriage, spending time with your significant other, new home, car, traveling, whatever it is that you want to do, right? You get to be one step closer to the things that you're really excited about doing. In addition to that, you're going to have the feelings of being a winner, belonging, being accepted into a community, having the respect and admiration of other pre-PTs, people who are behind you, people who are ahead of you, your parents, your family, your, your loved ones. Um, and you'll also embrace and accept your own personal strengths and experiences. That's my number one thing that I love about interview coaching is watching applicants go from not believing in themselves not believing in who they are and what they stand for and what they're bringing to a table and seeing the, the transformation when they get to the end of interview coaching. And they're like, I'm awesome. I do belong in this program. I've put in a ton of work over these past few years. I've been through a bunch of crap to get to this point. And I have paid the price to gain acceptance into a DPT program. And when they can look confidently in an interviewer's eye and they have that fire in them, it's not being cocky or conceited. It's, it's confidence. Okay. It's confidence and assurance that, you know, you belong in this program, you know, you belong and you deserve a seat at that table. Okay. Um, and then silencing your doubts and your doubters. Anyone who told you you couldn't believe in yourself that there's no way that you would get into physical therapy school. Nothing's better than sending them an interview or a, an email invite that you've been accepted. Okay. Um, let's see here. Hannah, if I'm currently finalizing and submitting my application for PT Cash, should I begin in my interview coaching package now or wait until I receive my first interview? So it's a great question, Hannah. Um, typically, what we do for interview coaching is we want it fairly close to when you have your first interview, okay? So what happens is there's a, there's a recency bias that happens when you're coaching. We don't want, We want you to kind of maintain an edge and to have these ideas fresh in your mind. So if you sign up for coaching right now, and you don't have an interview for two months down the road, then you're going to probably forget. And some of these ideas and the talking points are going to wear off. Okay. Um, with that being said, 
you can you can get it now if you want to, but there's a matter of time. It's a matter of emphasis on focusing on when it's close to the event. Typically for the two coaching sessions, what we recommend is we have one about a week and a half to two weeks before your interview. If you have an interview before then, it's fine. Um, but ideally, we like to do a week and a half before, and then we do another one a couple days before your big day just to keep you sharp and to give you some stuff to work on. Um, so that way you can go in and you can feel confident. That's the reason we do that. Yamaya has her interview this next week, right? We've done applicants where we have them interview on Monday and then on Wednesday again, and we they have time between Monday and Wednesday to practice and do the homework that we give them. That's totally fine. Not saying that like if you don't have this long runway that you can't sign up for coaching. You absolutely can. We, we fit everybody's schedules in and we accommodate for that because um, we want you to be prepared. But the ideal is you kind of have some spacing between there so you have enough time to work on the homework that we give you. But good question, Hannah.